Welcome to the American Intelligence Media. My name is Douglas Gabriel. Today, we're going to continue the reporting we've been doing on the fires in California, which have literally shaken every one of our members to the core of their being. And so we know that we have to get this information out that we're finding, but it's so perplexing that we can't quite help you understand it. So we got in contact with someone who was on the ground, who literally has lost his home to the fire, who has gone through the Oakland fire in the uh, 90s, who has seen this happening to his state of California for years and years and has been studying it. And now it has literally reached his home in uh, Concow, which is across, uh, I think, the mountain, we'll hear in a second, from Paradise, which we all know has uh, really been consumed by this. And what was the most shocking was when we saw a video that he sent us, and his name is Robert Ote, we'll be introducing him in just a second, but as he sent us this video, it is a miracle that he got out alive. And then when he told us his story, you're not going to believe this story. And then when he gave us the insight into what was happening, because we didn't quite understand it, we thought we understood some elements of it, but we needed to talk with somebody who was literally with their own eyes seen this happen, who could give us an eyewitness account. And so we are so fortunate that he contacted us uh, here at uh, Aim for Truth and that uh, Betsy and her team uh, got him uh, in contact with me and that I get the opportunity to interview him. So this is sad, folks. This is serious. I can't begin to tell you that the story that he told me earlier is one of the most powerful, devastating stories of what a fire apocalypse that you can possibly imagine in his own backyard with someone who's experienced. So this isn't, uh, as he points out, just California. This is every American. Basically, this is everyone who could be subject to these accelerants that are being used in these fires, both in the forest fires, the wild forest fires, as well as these targeted fires that are in suburban areas that are inexplicable. So we're very thrilled that he he has only a little time on his phone and he's staying with friends. He's safe and he's going to tell us a story. His name is Robert Ote. Robert, welcome to the show. Thanks, Douglas. For, uh, thanks so much for having me on to, to give my eyewitness testimony of what I saw. What you just told me blew my mind. You said you had like two minutes to get out, and at one point you're standing outside and you saw the tips of the trees and buildings, a whole bunch of buildings and outbuildings, all burst into flame without any accelerants, without any embers, without anything seemingly being the cause for this spontaneous combustion. Can you tell us how in the world you even got out of this uh, conflagration? Yeah, well, uh, I had to run through basically about 30 foot uh, long whipping flames that were driven by about 60, you know, 50 to 60 mile an hour gusts. And I carried a dog under each arm. I got a couple, I got three chew poodles actually. And so I took two of them and uh, threw them in my, uh, my Ford F-250 in the cab, which was sealed, thank God. Ran back. Uh, my cabin was about 25% on fire by that time. Grabbed my third dog. Thank God I had, you know, within two or three breaths, I would have died of smoke uh, inhalation. And uh, I got into my cab with my third dog, closed the cab, and thank God there was enough clean air in there to get me about four or five miles down the road. But as I turned around, I looked my, my entire gate. I had a huge metal gate with, um, you know, one by 12 uh, cedar planks on it, and the entire thing was engulfed in flame. And there really wasn't much but a little grass around that could have been, you know, ignited these six-foot planks everywhere across the face of the gate. So I had to uh, basically take my F-250 and ram through that gate and knock it loose. You know, I knocked it off the hinges and, and drove over it. And then I drove down into the Conco, Concow Valley down Concow Road about a mile and a half into, um, into the valley. Uh, it was so much so smoke, I had to drive by bra uh, Braille just to get off of the, uh, the dirt road that I'm on to get onto Concow Road. But you couldn't see three feet in front of the, uh, the truck with the headlights on because it was black. I mean, there was so much uh, smoke you couldn't see. So in front of me, somebody had plowed into uh, somebody else that was leaving their property. They got T-boned. Both of those cars were burnt to the ground and blocking the road. So I rammed those both with my F-250. They're like a V kind of, and they, they went to each side. And I was able to drive about four to five miles through burning flames, towering all the way to 100, 150 foot tall cedars and pines on both sides of the road all the way out. Wow. 
my God. Tell, tell them about the lake and about how some of your neighbors were able to, 100 of them saved their lives by going to the lake. Yeah, that's where I hopefully figured out, you know, happened to the guys that got in that wreck. Because at, at that point, it was probably about 150 feet downhill into the lake. There's no way anybody could have run through four or five miles of flames. So I'm sure, I hope that those guys did that. But I understand from the reports I'm hearing, about 100 people survived, you know, by going and jumping in the lake. Even a like a 91-year-old woman. And apparently, you know, that, that water's probably around 45 degrees this time of year. And they made it out to an island, and they survived. You know, so it's it's a it's a miracle as well. What about your neighbors, Robert? What, you said that when, for some reason, I think I, I didn't get it quite straight. You came out and you looked up on the mountain where the flames were, and they were far away. And you came out to yeah. check it, and then all of a sudden, you saw everything burst into flames. Yeah, well, like I was telling you earlier when we talked before this, that, uh, you know, I'd survived the Oakland firestorm back in 1991, and um, I watched for five hours how that fire worked, you know, because I was at the top, uh, I was up by Broadway Terrace, you know, up at the top, I had a a view of everything. In fact, I saw it start. I saw the very beginning little smoke start at the um, the other side of, like, it was kind of on the Berkeley side of uh, 24 there. And uh, I remarked to a couple of my friends, I'm like, there's an arsonist up there because three days earlier a fire had started. And once again, uh, there was a, it was going again. And it turns out it was some uh, underground roots that had kept burning that the fire department didn't know. That started again. So I witnessed, you know, directly for hours how those flames started with embers falling from the sky, burning shingles, starting fires. This, um, even though the environmental conditions were very similar, hot, dry, windy, uh, about the same time of year, you know, October, November, uh, the fire was radically different because I watched um, fires spring up all around me and below me and several miles in front of me, in, in front of the fire line itself. And there was no falling embers. There was no burning, sh- you, know, you know, chunks of wood. Uh, I had a, a, a pile of almond wood, about a cord and a half sitting there, and that thing in, uh, flamed on in a matter of, you know, 30 seconds, 45 seconds with 20-foot high flames. Something like that, if you started even with gasoline, would take maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes to, to turn into a, uh, you know, a fire like that. So I watched ex- flames exploding all around me, and I never saw an ember. And I saw these, um, these old burned-out cedars that were like maybe 75 feet tall. The very tops of those were on fire like torches. You know, there were maybe you know, uh, 100 yards in front of me, and I was at least a mile in front of the fire line at that point. I thought I had time to get out. And you said that your outbuildings and your house and the houses around you all started to burn at once. Um, I know that uh, all my stuff started to burn at once, and then my neighbor right across the street, but I couldn't see. uh, I've got another neighbor that on the way out. I couldn't see their place because it's kind of hidden behind a hill. And, but, uh, I can tell you, I, dozens of fires sprang up all around me and below me without, you know, they're, they're far in front of the fire line without any falling, burning embers. And like I said, I saw that directly in Oakland. I know how the fires work and this was not the same. Now, the, the next thing I have to say is so terribly, horribly sad. So you got out, you said that you maybe had a minute, 45 seconds, two minutes, to yeah. get it together, you didn't even grab your computer, which had your whole life work on it because your life was in that much danger. You checked on your neighbors, you jumped in your vehicle with your dogs, and you barely had enough oxygen to get down the road and to get to a place that was safer. Exactly. Thank God I had oxygen in the cab because the smoke was so thick. I really felt if I took two or three more breaths, I would have died of smoke inhalation. Well, the sad thing is, I, I imagine many others in your town did not make it oh yeah yeah i live in a very um a very complex area as far as the woods go i mean the roads go through the woods um they call it shattered glass the uh, this area i'm at because the parcels are so bizarre these little slivers and the roads are really tight and they're you know surrounded by 150 foot cedars and pines and uh, it, I can see that it'd be extremely tough to get out of there. There's a, a, a road called Hoffman Road, which is where a lot of those people jumped in the lake from the back side of uh, Concow Lake. Um, that Once that road gets blocked, you can't get to Concow Road, which is the only way out. And there's a 
a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of roads that go off of Hoffman. And so a lot of people were trapped out there. And if, you know, if they didn't get in the lake, they didn't make it because that whole place was wiped out. So you had no other exit. There's all Concow Road is the only way out. And you could go the other way uh, up the mountain towards Fulgus, but that was completely on fire. So that wasn't an option. There was only one, you know, I didn't stop at all. I didn't turn around. I just made, I blazed my way out of there and barely made it. Uh, as, as I got past Concow Lake, there's a real steep grade there. And I could see that finally there was some air. You could get out of that dense smoke and, and get some fresher air. But they had a fire engine on my side of the road halfway off the road, backing up the hill, and three idiots in front of me pulled over. They actually stopped because of the guys, I guess, because they saw a flashing red light, and they figured they had to stop, and their flames rushing all around. I just blew past all of them. I blew past the, the you know, over the double yellow line, up a, up a hill. Uh, I knew nobody would be coming our way, so I just went over the double yellow line and passed the fire engine and all those cars. And uh, even one guy and his friend, I guess, they were hugging each other. And they were using an ATV. They rode through the flame on an ATV. I, they must have gotten burned extremely bad. Oh, my God. That's just horrifying. Now, yeah. So, so this is happening in many places in California. Yeah. These yeah. kind just of wildfires. Santa Rosa. And, yeah, and there's a big one there. The big Mendocino fire was the biggest one in the history of the state before this. And as right now, they're saying there may be a thousand missing people, and you have said yeah. that may be conservative estimates in relationship to what you personally saw. Oh yeah, there's just so many places up in the mountains where I live that people could get trapped easily. There's just no way out. And as you say, you are well. You didn't say this, but you're an experienced fire watcher. The people around yeah. you knew these fires were up in the mountain. They were watching them carefully, and then all of a sudden, everyone is overwhelmed by inexplicably fast fires that seem to have uh, invisible accelerants on them. Uh, yeah, can, exactly. Can you explain any of this in terms of uh, what you've studied or what you believe or even what you speculate? Oh, sure. Well, they've been you know covering us with chemtrails with uh, nanoparticles of aluminum, strontium, and barium for years now, and that stuff accumulates in the forests, uh, the forests and our houses, and in us, I mean, we're being sprayed constantly. From where I see, where I live, I can see everything out in the Central Valley. I can see the spraying. I tell you, I can. it even looks like crop dusting. I see the beginning point and the ending point where they go. They spray from down somewhere by, like, Yuba City up to Redding. And one plane after another after another does it, you know. And this is continuous. I've been watching this for years, you know. So I can see those big, long ones that go up and down the coast, but I see it. Uh, a stuff that looks like it's intentionally sprayed in our specific area in a specific pattern for years. Now, Robert, um, are you on the other side of the mountain? Is, is uh, uh, Concow on the other side of the mountain of Paradise, or is it a, a valley, or what's... You're near Paradise, right? Um, yeah, I am. Uh, actually, Polgus is on the other side of a mountain range in the west fork of the Feather River, okay? Uh, it's a hydro station for PG&E. And they believe that's what caused it, a wire there or something. Uh, but you go up and over the mountain. It's probably about six miles uh, as the crow flies, but it's up and over a very big mountain range. And then I live in a, an area that's like a huge bowl with a Concal Lake at the bottom. That area then goes up and over a mountain range to the north fork of the Feather River. There's a road called Jordan Hill Road, which you can take from Concal up and over that mountain and then down through the North Fork of the Feather River, and it ends up in Megalia. So uh, it's quite a ways. It's further to Paradise than it is, um, you know, from Polgus to me. Okay. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand that in um, the area around Paradise, just before the fires, that they had the most extensive, what they called, you know, chemtrails, or spraying of that area that people had seen. It was so amazing that planes were so low and they were dropping so much stuff that they were all kind of freaking out just days before the fire started. Did you have any kind of planes in your area dropping stuff just before this? Not low, but um, I, I tell you, it's been the same. I mean, this has been going on for years. And, so, you know, it's really bizarre. when there, There's some days when they don't spray, and you're looking at a crystal clear blue sky, and you go, wow, this is amazing, you know, because I'm used to every single day seen dozens and dozens of trails it just from my vantage point i can look out over the central valley and i i don't have to look straight up to see chemtrails i'm looking 
right out my front window of them being sprayed all around. So I have a perfect view of it. You had said that the aluminum and the other metals that are in chemtrails that are certainly, we, we all know that the geoengineering is most focused on California of any other state in the union. And so you had mentioned that the aluminum, when it lights on fire, is like magnesium. And I, I know magnesium. It's as bright as the sun when it lights on fire. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And it's, the fire is yeah. so hot. It's ridiculous. It can, it can start a campfire, you know, with a few little scrapes of magnesium. It can start a campfire. Right. So what you're yeah. saying is there's some kind of acceler. There, there's the accelerant is the aluminum. And then what is it that ignites the aluminum? Because something ignited it because you didn't look around and see 40 fires starting at once with no embers flying, with no other accelerants, with no explanation, without there being some invisible electromagnetic force, uh, whatever it might be, a diffuse laser. It could be what they call these directed energy weapons. So let's just say that it could even be on the cell towers. Let's say that it could be in an airplane, a drone, or a satellite. One way or the other... Are you suggesting that something electromagnetic struck those accelerants, those aluminum particles, and actually lit on fire the top of the trees and literally also the top of the, some of the houses and like the pile of wood that you had there, which is inexplicable. It could get to, you know, such a huge indeed, flame. Indeed. Uh, it defies all logic and reason. Uh, anything I've experienced in my life, what I saw, and, you know, it's well-known fact that these technologies exist. Uh, you know, the directed energy weapons are real. Maybe there's a video that shows them right on Fox News sh uh, shooting drones out uh, from Earth-based stuff. So imagine what they've got uh, in dark, uh, dark projects, you know, up in space and satellites. The military has got this stuff, obviously. This is nothing new. Uh, Nikola Tesla created the death ray almost 100 years ago. Uh, this technology is uh, the kind of thing that you would keep hidden until you wanted to use it. Uh, I'm sure the military's had this technology for a long time. Uh, but they're perfecting it now. Um, I see it. it's been done in Iran and China, uh, Canada, uh, several places in the United States, Greece, Portugal. All these uh, places uh, are coming under the same exact kind of attack, it appears. And that's the part that scares my group so bad. This isn't just California. If you can take no. cars on the freeway with no fire to the left or right of the freeway, and cars are bursting into flames, and people don't even have time to get out of the car, just like you would had literally seconds to get out of your house, leaving your most valued possessions, or you would have died. Same thing with people yeah. in cars on a freeway. Yeah. How is that happening? How is that even possible unless there is a new type of a weapon that is now being used liberally in California under multiple settings, uh, many different parameters, I had assumed it was in, only in those suburb areas where they you could see it was targeted, but it's clearly also with these wildfires that you just almost lost your life, and I'm sure you've lost friends' lives in these fires. This is absurd yeah. that it, 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 it's yeah. now comprehensive. This isn't just trying to take out the land they need for the high-speed rail or land that some people know belonged to a certain politician's husband, and he made uh, uh, killings off of these killings no this is something much bigger these are like experimental uh attempts at just seeing how far they can take this technology is is all i can assume how do you feel about that robert you're right there in the thick of it you barely got out with your life did you even gather any clothes by the way did you gather anything i couldn't get anything i had a, a utility kilt a vest and some mug boots on and i had I could just get my dogs, I, the two, and I made a trip back, grabbed the third one. I could have, you know, reached over with my left, right hand and grabbed at least my terabyte hard drive that had most of my last research on it. I couldn't do it. I, in my mind, I, I realized if I took two or three more smokes of that, I would die, you know, and I would never make it out to my truck, and my pups and I would all die. We'd all be burned alive. And you're healthy. You've gone through fires. You're a Californian. You know what you're talking about. You understand these things. And look what slim chance you had. Uh, it just makes me want to cry. Yeah, it's been powerful. It's been a very, very um, grueling experience, to say the least. But, you know, as I've said, I survived the Oakland firestorm and um, kind of adopted the, the, you know, the philosophy way back when that 
you know, I just have to accept wherever the dice roll, you know, they, where they land in my life. I've been through some, a lot of misery and pain in my life. And, uh, I survived that. It took about six years to recover economically from it. But, um, with great humility, I just accept my fate, whatever that is, you know? And, um, right now though, I'm, I'm very upset, very, I'm mad as hell. I, I'm ready to fight harder than I've ever fight, fought in my life, exposing these racketeers, these, these criminals, that are basically enslaving this planet and forcing this on all of us, you know, because you, you, you're, I'm sure, very well aware of Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, and, uh, you know, population control is number one on the agenda of these people, and they'd really like to wipe us out, you know, so it can usher in a new world where they're in full control and break out all their technologies that uh, they've kept hidden from us. That's, that's my true belief. That's, that's my conclusion after teaching this stuff for 16 years, and exposing all these people through my website, my books, and all the videos I've made, that is, that's the only thing I can conclude after all this. It's staggering. Uh, you, two things you told me make it even worse, and that's that so many of these people can't get fire insurance because this is now uh, a yearly occurrence, and so they're going to lose in, in every way, and the corporations yeah, yeah. will win in every way. Yeah, they wouldn't allow me to insure my place because I had a, a cabin with a trailer built onto it. So that was like a no-no. So all they would give me, for example, was a, a personal property insurance, which was measly. It was like next to nothing. And the really sad thing is they've chiseled me down. Uh, they've pulled 4000 out of that and claimed that my property has been devalued. You know, So even though it was a pathetically small, like you know, 20000 basically, you know, insurance policy, they chiseled that down on me. And... And this is a reputable, highly reputable company. I'm not going to mention their name because, um, you know, I don't want to, you know, want to deal with that right now. But they're, high, you know, one of the best insurance companies in our country for sure. And uh, they chiseled me down, which I, I will, of course, be appealing. But in, a, in these cases of such mass devastation and such a huge emergency, so many people are going through this both last year and this year that I, yeah. I just don't understand how the state can handle such things. And the other thing that you said, which really was shocking to me, is that somewhere, I think you said you noticed that it was your land was marked, uh, that it was not even going to be inhabited land at, at, in the future or something to that effect in terms of the plans that they have for the high-speed rail and so on and so forth. So your land is, is considered incidental, so they're like just collecting it up, I, I guess, by doing these things, and, and then they have large swaths of land that then they can develop yeah what i've seen in the past is these uh un uh, no-go zones as uh, as per the agenda 21 uh, uh program so yeah it looks like they really want to get us off the land they don't want people living off grid like i was uh being free uh i had no electricity on my property i had generators so they don't want people living like that um i was out i you know i was in an absolute state of personal freedom out there and Surrounded by a beautiful, and my piece of property is magical. It's uh, I, I I could go on for hours about how gorgeous this place is, and uh, and everything that it's done for me. This this beautiful piece of land, but now it's completely wiped out. You know, so. And in your case, it, it, the trees all around were also burnt. So your the, the the beauty of the land, the, pro, the the resources, the natural resources are also burnt. In many cases, the trees don't burn; just the houses burn, which seems to be some kind of strange attack that we've never seen anything like that before. But with your case, everything's gone. I mean, you you had to go through walls of fire just to get out alive, and I imagine when you go back, it's going to be devastation. Oh, absolutely. And you see, the thing about my place is it burned down about nine or ten years ago in the big Con Cal fire, which was a 70,000-acre fire. Uh, the California Department of Forestry came in with helicopters and dropped incendiary devices on my property. This is before I owned it. I've only owned it for three years. And the property next to me, they actually found the incendiary devices to light a backfire. That that failed, and it, the wind shifted on them, and it was uh, California Department of Forestry's fire. Um, fault that 70,000 acres had burnt. So my place had already burnt. It was in a period of restoration, uh, regeneration, you know, all the trees, the oaks were coming back, they were 10 to 15 foot tall. But there was an enormous amount of, uh, you know, the old cedars and, and things like that were, that were still on the ground that didn't burn fully from the last fire. 
So all that stuff went up like crazy. There was even a lot of old oaks and old cedars still standing from nine or 10 years ago. And that stuff obviously got torched real easy. So there was an enormous amount of accelerant on my entire property and much of the area around me as well. It's amazing what all you've seen, what all you've witnessed, and what all you've survived. Your house in Oakland, uh, you said it was taken, right? It was completely burnt? Yeah, burned to the ground. There was nothing left. And you uh, just recovering from that, and then you go to an area where they're trying to recover from another fire, and then you're caught in this congregation that is literally an apocalypse uh, uh, from hell. I, I just yeah. don't understand um, how anyone can feel secure in California at, at this point because these fires have reached in, into Malibu, into San Bernardino, into uh, right next to cities. Right, uh, it's There's uh, no area that seems to be safe whatsoever. Well, I, it's not just uh, California, Douglas. Uh, as we were, as I said earlier, Iran, China, Portugal, Greece, all these places are having the same types of fires. So nobody's safe anywhere on this planet anymore, in my personal opinion. And as we talked earlier about it, I'm going to take this up a, uh, a notch, you know, get into the stuff that a lot of people are going to have a hard time with. But Bill Cooper stated before they shot him dead in his front lawn that uh, they were going to play the alien invasion card and pretend like there's aliens attacking us. And with this technology, it'd be easy to fake that and blame it on the aliens. You know, just white cities wiped out. Oh, it's aliens. They're, you know, they're, they're uh, you know, hitting us with these particle beams and stuff. You know, so uh, I have to believe that I can only conclude that that's the direction this whole thing is going. Well, the pictures that I have seen of people in their vehicles driving down the road right next to a beach, no forest anywhere in sight, no grass, no nothing flammable, and the cars look as if the aliens have come and shot them with ray guns, ray beams. Yeah, Beyond exactly. a shadow of a doubt, yeah. that was the most apocalyptic. I thought it was a, a, a set on a movie, but it was real, and there's no people. Where are the people? There's a thousand missing right. people, and I think a lot of them were in those cars because those cars, the doors weren't open, and they were burned. Right. They were burned so right. so bad that, as you just pointed out, you didn't, you couldn't take one more breath. If you had taken one more breath, it could have been the end of you. So yeah. they couldn't even yeah. get out of their cars. They couldn't get their babies out of their baby seats. They couldn't open right. their door and exit a car that burst into flames. How is that right. possible? But you pointed out to me well, in a previous conversation how that's possible. You might want to tell people how that is possible. Yeah, well, I had been making some comments on some of these vids, and a guy, uh, turns out he's from beforeitsnews.org, I think is the name of the channel. Yeah. Uh, he's got some pretty pretty out there sort of claims at this point. I'm willing to investigate all of them. He told me that there's something called Project Athena or something where they can track all you know hundreds or maybe even thousands of targets simultaneously with computers due to your chip in your car and your cell phone, and they know who all the dissidents are and everybody who's against them, and literally they could just take them out, uh, you know, multiple, you know, hundreds or thousands of, of uh, targets simultaneously with these lasers, just zapping them one after another. So uh, I've got, I don't know if this is true or not, but i got to tell you, it's, we all need to look into this. You know, it very well may be true, and this may very well be exactly what they're planning with this fake alien invasion. Of course, this is just, you know, my thoughts on it, but I, I don't know what else to conclude at this point. Right. Well, I do know there's a thing called full-spectrum um, warfighting, where with lasers in space, they can tag anything and track it for as long as they want, and at any point, they can use an accelerated particle beam, they could use a diffuse laser, they can use a microwave, a millowave, uh, uh, accelerated particle, all kinds of things to attack that target. We had saw this in the Panamanian War when we actually saw tanks that were melted into puddles of metal. And that's yep. the only thing I've yep. ever seen that where it came into the uh, public light, even though I know of these things because of uh, contacts I have. And I know the um, full-spectrum warfighting is beyond imagination and I myself was in the NSA, and I used to track the thousand points of light, and those were accelerated particle beams, and that was back in the seventies. So what they have now, yeah, yes, it would be yeah. much, 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 much worse. Uh, but the problem yeah. is, is using it on civilians and using it what right. seems to be absolutely experimental, because they even 
I don't care in all the conspiracy theories I've heard, or we could also call them suggestions or uh, working ideas. I don't see any justification for this type of open dissemination of a weapon of this magnitude. But as you just pointed out twice for me and first time went over my head, that this is being done in other countries. Well, I know that it's being done in South Africa because we know that Eric Schmidt launched 17 satellites that he was emitting 5G from space in experiments on South Africa. Well, guess what? They don't need 5G in South Africa. So what were they doing? It was weaponizing it. So I knew that that was happening, oh, two years ago, and I've been telling people about that, but I just didn't think, Robert, and it just makes me so upset. You want to cry, then you want to get angry, that this is being done on Americans and that you were targeted. I I mean, not maybe specifically you, but for certain, your community was targeted. And that's Absolutely. disgusting. I, I may have been tar- I may have been targeted as well. I must qualify that and let you know that uh, my Ford is a 1991. There's no modern chip in it, and I had no cell phone. So those two things that uh, they, they're saying with the Project Athena that can be used against you to basically take you out, I had neither one of them. Plus, I was under a thick layer of smoke that was so bad, you couldn't see three feet in front of you. It was like being out at midnight in smoke. That's how dark it was. So I couldn't be even seen from space or even a, a vehicle that might have been above the, the smoke. So that may have been my, my uh, you know, my escape uh, may have been augmented by that, the fact that I didn't possess that stuff, this new technology. Oh, without a doubt. The QRS-11 is in every uh, modern vehicle, the chip, as you're pointing out. Uh, so yeah. are you, you're on the ground in California. You've been through this for yeah. years. Are people exiting California because they believe they're being targeted with a fire apocalypse? I don't know about that. Um, I think there's a mass exodus out of here because everybody's sick of these uh, politicians that have destroyed our, uh, our state, you know, uh, Brown and Pelosi and Feinstein and all these other traitors. Uh, these people should be, uh, 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 you know, brought in and tried for treason and crimes against humanity after this. Uh, I think they're all involved. And, and Gavin Newsom, he's, uh, I guess he's Pelosi's nephew or something. I mean, these people, uh, all these rich people that are running this thing, they don't care about us, not a bit, you know. So no, I, they all need to be investigated. I totally agree. You are, you're, those are sweet words to my ears because that's exactly what I say all the time. And I get into showing how these politicians have vested interests and they make a ton of money off of this stuff. For Richard Bloom, the husband yeah. of Diane Feinstein, is the one who got the billion dollar contract for the high speed rail. And it, in some cases, exactly overlays yeah. pretty clearly upon some of the burn areas from these fires. I don't know if that's true. I do know that last year in Napa Valley, many of those houses that were literally, wep- w- through some kind of weaponization, were targeted and incinerated and literally vaporized, vaporized, and I'm not exaggerating when I say vaporized, those were areas where he uh, made a ton of money off of his real estate ventures, which he just happened to have uh, got involved in just before that. So when someone knows yeah. about an area, buys into it, and then it burns up, I, and, and his wife is a Chinese spy, for heaven's sakes, 20 years long, Diane Feinstein has been working for the Chinese, uh, so is Mitch McConnell now and his wife. It, it, it doesn't surprise me. People say the Chinese are behind this. People say there's you know, old uh, gold veins that, uh, and diamond veins, and the Chinese are looking for resources. Here's what's happening for sure. The Chinese are buying everything they can because they bought our U.S. Treasury bonds. And when we they sold them back to us, they're using those dollars to buy everything they can in America. That doesn't worry me because mm, five years from now, when we break their back, they'll be just like Japan. When Japan did the same thing, when they had become our number one manufacturer. So later down the line, everything China is buying now, we'll buy back for pennies on the dollar. But... Unfortunately, we're dealing with a totalitarian communist government that is so ruthless that nothing can be put past them. So are the Chinese doing real estate development deals through political uh, contacts here in America and using their own satellites uh, to basically take advantage of geoengineering accelerant particles that are being dropped all all over California? I could believe that. I just don't have the evidence to prove it. Right, yeah. And you think, you know, you think back to, uh, as well, 9-11, you know, and there was that huge metal spire left over the guts of the building, and it was vaporized by a scalar weapon. I mean, you, you see it on a video. It just disappeared, just vaporized. 
So oh, yeah. this this goes way back. They've been testing this for quite a while now. And, and you know, then, of course, Chertoff, he's like running Homeland Security, and they put all his scanners, so his company makes a fortune off of this new terrorist, you know, based on complete lies, this new, uh, new terrorist agenda. So, you know, all these rich people, they're just getting richer, and they're getting more control. I've been indicting the energy barons, the warmongers, and the central bankers since 2002 when I wrote my first book, Free Energy and Free Thinking. I can, you know, anybody wants, uh, it's online, it's free, go read it. All the proof is there that free energy technologies exist, but we're slaved into this grid. We're burning fuels. We're having war to fight for those fuels. And the central bankers are financing and making a killing out of everything. So the rich are getting richer and the rest of us are getting wiped out. That's, that's, that's the new normal. You know? and, and they used to call you a conspiracy theorist until they now literally have burnt up your home, your neighborhood, and uh, yeah. made you homeless. What are you going to do next, Robert? That's what my readers and our listeners will ask next. How can I help him? And what will you do next? Because when you, you know, this, you look at these pictures and it's, you, you don't know. You don't know whether to trust any pictures you ever see. But you talk to somebody who was there and I'm afraid it becomes very, very, very real. So you're staying at friends, yeah. uh, I mean, at relatives' house. Uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to be able to go back to your land? Are you going to be able to fight and keep it? Or what will happen with you? Well, yeah, that's the next step. We still can't get in yet. And it may be at least another week. You know, they've taken they take cadaver dogs there and searched the whole area where I live. They're not letting anybody in there. Unfortunately, they've already found two looters there and four in, um, in Concow. But there's cowboys out there who have got the shoot on command uh, from the sheriff, so they'll be killing these bastards. Um, i, I got to tell you, I'm just going to go back. Uh, I, I've got very little money. I'm going to try to get back on my property, put a trailer there, and dig myself out of the ashes and continue my fight exposing these people because, like I said, I've been doing this for 16 years. This isn't new to me. Uh, I've been aware of all this stuff all along, and now I've seen it firsthand. I was a little bit skeptical with, when Deborah Tavares was talking about the, the do and all that, you know, in Santa Rosa, uh, it's, you have to be skeptical, you know, but I now seeing it firsthand, I can tell you, I've never, it has nothing to do with the Oakland firestorm or what I saw personally for five hours as I witnessed that fire, this was radically different. And I've got to believe that do was involved and possibly a scalar weapon. I don't, I don't know if you saw that, uh, space based video where they showed the, 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 the fire was starting and there was this massive explosion and a white plume came up many thousands of feet above it. That arced over to my side of the mountain. I don't know if, have you seen that video yet? Wow, no. It's actually on a channel called Mike Morales' channel. Uh, I remember that. Uh, I actually wrote him because he had some disinfo, not intentionally, but he had bought into some of the weather maps, and he was saying there was no wind, and you know the humidity was 43%. That is not true. It blew for days. It blew all night so loud I could barely sleep because it was so noisy. And I, I have a humidity gauge on my property that I watch constantly, it's been down around 10% or less for the last month to month and a half. So everything was extremely dry and a huge wind. So that is the truth. I mean, so there's some disinformation out there about that. Had you ever seen or uh, experienced winds like that before at your place? Oh, yeah, yeah. This is where I live. Uh, generally, this time of year, you will have winds that can get up to 100 miles an hour where I live. And generally in the fall like this. It was like that last year and the year before. I've only been there for three years, so, but uh, I've seen an enormous amounts of winds. I mean, there's it gets really, really windy where I'm at. So they know that's just a wonderful accelerant for fire if they just happen to have some sparks jump off of the, uh, 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 would you say, the dam in the area or the uh, the power plant in the area or so on and so forth. And that's what it seems to always be tracked back to is, you know, the um, the poor maintenance of some of the electrical wires throughout all of California. I don't know whether I believe those things or whether I believe that this is targeted and that they take advantage of the fact that you have fantastic winds there at a certain time of the year. And if you start a fire, it's going to go crazy and going to clear out a lot of the area that they don't want you independent people out there uh, basically standing yeah, up. They may have, yeah, they may have used due to start the electrical fire on the wires themselves. Who knows? I mean, it's all, you know, speculation at this point. Exactly. Uh, but I got to say, I got to say, um, you know, I did, I, I registered through FEMA for the grant, you know, because I've got next to nothing. And uh, I had a 20 minute interview online. And I, when we got to this one question about the property, the woman asked me if I'd seen lava on my property. Wow. 
Can you imagine that? And then I start hearing these little, you know, things on videos about lava. And, you know, that whole area is a huge lava field. I mean, uh, Butte County is just a big lava flow, you know, uh, ancient basalt flow everywhere. So if they used a scalar weapon on that area, which that huge plume may have been, because it was a really instantaneous kind of explosion and arc, they may have opened a fissure there in that basalt plateau somewhere. And there may be, you know, there may be a lot involved in, in the long term. So who knows? At this point, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to tell. But it's just, we need to all investigate this. Everybody should be looking at this every, from every possible angle. That's all I'm saying. Absolutely. And when we heard about you, we checked out your site and we thought, oh my goodness, this person is awake and aware. He's not going to be just a person who's going to be a victim. He's going to be able to give us uh, a clear view of what happened on the ground and what it is that you what you have witnessed and so we thought okay let's let's make contact with him and i'm so glad that we did i just want to say again my deepest condolences to your friends who have not made it and my best of blessings to you as you're trying to find a new life and get back on your land and reclaim it and thank you for having this conversation with us and to all the people that are there in your area and all throughout California and as you pointed out the world who are being subjected to these firestorms our prayers go out to you and we need to take the wrath that we feel and turn it into the kind of motivation you just described Robert and do not stop until we fight this figure out what it is who's behind it and end it yes indeed and I, I swear I've given you the most concise and accurate and honest uh, you know, interpretation of what I've seen and through my work and all that that I can give you. I have nothing. I've never made any money off the. I've given everything away free, except for my last book, which is next to nothing. Um, I've I've done all this as a free gift for humanity because I love humanity. I hate the people that are running this this world. We could have a beautiful world. We could have a beautiful world with a Schauberger explosion turbines in every home. That's true national security. I mean, the grid is a, is a national security disaster, and it's a slave racket. You know, we've got all these metals tied up in this huge grid that we, we talk about being short on metals. Take down the grid. Put an implosion, uh, implosion motor in every single home, which requires no fuel, and all of us could be free. We could have our own energy. That's, that's national security. And I also think, uh, like, like Switzerland, they, two years of military service, and then they arm you. Everybody's armed over there. We should all, you know, they're trying to get our guns, they, uh, you know, they, all these fake flag, uh, false flag shootings and stuff. They want every last gun. They, they don't want to just increment, uh, take part of them. They want everybody's guns as quick as possible. They want to disarm the population so we have no recourse. Well, they just disarmed you. You didn't have time to grab your gun. Yeah, it's gone. It's melted. It's vaporized or whatever. It's gone. This is just astounding. We're not going to yep. let this depress us. We're going to let that anger be set aside. We're going to take up holy wrath. And we're going to continue to work on this and continue to fight this. And Robert, we're going to keep track of you. And please keep us posted on what you're doing and if there's anything we can do to help. Oh, for sure. You know, as soon as I get in, I'll be shooting a video of the property and giving a narrative. And so I'll post that on my website. You know, it's the very second we're allowed in there. I'll be up there. I'll have a video camera. And I'll document it all, and I will forward that to you and your your audience, so you can see exactly what happened up there. Well, thank you for that. We're going to stick with you, and uh, we just send you our blessings and hope that you're able to get it back together and that you can do something to help save these situation in California and throughout the rest of the world, and basically reach that critical mass of consciousness that can change the way that people think. So, Robert, that's it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, our, our deepest, deepest sympathies for you and what you've had to go through and all your friends and all your neighbors. We'll talk to you soon. I sure appreciate it, Douglas. And, uh, you know, much love to your audience. And please, everybody, we have to band together. I mean, we, we can't allow the politicians to fix this. They're a huge part of the problem. We need to band together as humans and protect each other. 